Hello, welcome back to the Cognitive Whiteboard. My name's Luke and today we're starting a series of videos uh, around fascist modeling. So when we do fascist modeling, we're normally trying to achieve one or two of these kinds of uh, uh, effects. We're trying to represent particular rock flow behaviors. Uh, so there might be correlative relationships between things like um, porosity and permeability or relative permeability differences that might be on a bin-like behavior. Um, or we're trying to represent geobody shapes. Usually um, we see an outcrop like this psychedelic representation of, uh, of a fluvial system that there's a lot of complexity in those geobodies out there. And fascies are a very useful way of getting that into your model. Now, when we do our fascies modeling, we have to be careful because there's a lot of cats that like to use that term. Uh, the sedimentologist, the petrophysicist, the seismic interpreter all may use the term fascies for their own meaning. Uh, the sedimentologist is perhaps the most traditional way of thinking about it. Um, they're trying to represent depositional systems and they get to see all the way down to the millimeter scale uh, textual relationships uh, that are available essentially only um, uh, to the naked eye. And, and that can help them see quite a lot of character uh, in, the, uh, in the rocks. By the time the petrophysicist gets to see most of the information, most of their logs are at the, uh, the 10 to centimeter to meter type um, resolution. Uh, and, and a lot of the particularly older wells lack um, image logs that can give them some of the same textual information that the sedimentologist sees. So realistically, the petrophysicist is dealing with mineralogical effects. And of course, the seismic interpreter does their best to try to extrapolate that in 3D, but they're working from a meter plus um, vertical resolution. And what they get to see with that acoustic response is orders of magnitude different to what the uh, sedimentologist can do. So it's important that we get everyone around the table and understand uh, how they link together because particularly from seismic all the way down to sedimentology, there is a pretty difficult choice um, sometimes in trying to bring those two sciences together. And when we do, we come then into the geomodels realm. Uh, the geomodeler gets the choice of how they're going to try to distribute those properties, and they're not all that easy to do. The traditional object-based and pixel-based methods are still out there and still in use and still add lots of value. Um, the pixel-based methods are very good at incorporating external trends, uh, so say seismic data or, or map-based behaviors that you want to instill upon your model. That can help you get those spatial relationships done very, very well. Um, very good at honoring lots of different probabilities. But the object-based models are perhaps more powerful than the pixel-based methods at preserving some of those geobody shapes. Uh, and that can be particularly useful in, say, channelized bodies. Um, but you can also see that some of the, uh, the choices you get in creating an object-based model don't necessarily very well reflect uh, what we see in the outcrop. So it's important to remember to model what's deposited and preserved, not what's um, in an active modern system. But uh, the two came together with multi-point statistics where we used a object-based model and a pixel-based methodology to try to give us both the geobody shapes and the external trends um, all in the one kind of a solution. And in many regards, it's probably one of the most powerful methods that's out there in the industry today. It's preferred by a lot of the super majors. I've been using it for a long time. I did feel like a bit of a dunce when I started. It's very complex to do, um, and it takes a lot of learning. But if you understand the principles of what goes into it, it can be a very powerful tool to add to the arsenal. Um, we will talk all about these methods in the upcoming videos. So we'll go into a little bit more detail on how we can get these sing, to sing and dance in the way that you want them to. But at the end, it's important that we have a good set of quality control checks to make sure we're getting what we want out of our model. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the consistency of the scale that we had at this conversation preserved inside our modeling methods. We also want to make sure that we've got all of the spatial relationships that we want to instill upon um, the map-based trends, the seismic type trends are coming into our modeling systems. And we want to make sure these internal architectures um, that we were interested in um, are preserved inside that. So in the coming videos, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can bring all of those things together. Thanks very much.